Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to this session on Uyuni running on Kubernetes. Um, I'm Cedric Bosdona, working in the SUSE manager team. Um, I've been working in the past on LibreOffice and LibVirt, um, and since a few years working on, on SUSE manager and Uyuni. So uh, this session is about showing how we're in the process to convert our legacy monolithic application into something that is containerizable. So for the agent, I will go through first a short uni presentation. Who, know, who doesn't know what is a uni? OK, so it's still worth having the presentation. And, and then we'll go through um, the path we chose to, to go towards containers, because it's not so easy. There are multiple solutions. And then we'll go through the benefits we can expect and whether we will reach them or not. So Uni is a web application. And it is something that helps you managing systems, so your servers, um, VMs, and whatever. You can manage them from one entry point. You can manage multiple distributions, so not only SUSE distributions. It can be also Red Hat or D um, Debian, Ubuntu, and, and their clones. And of course, if you want to add support for another distro, why not? Just um, we accept contributions. Um, basically, you can have software inventory, hardware inventory on, on these, these machines. You can have configuration management, um, so you can ultimately see the differences and, and roll back the, the change, um, roll new changes. And you can also deploy and install packages and other workloads. And one of the cool things also is that you have a fine control on what application go into the, 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 the system. So you, you can filter out packages in, in, the, in, in your RPMs or, or dev files so that you can only get what you want. And as for the name Uni, it comes from um, a salt flat in South, Africa, uh, South America. And it obviously has a relationship with SALT as the project, as we'll see later. So Uyuni is the upstream of SUSE Manager. That has not been the case forever. At the beginning of times, at the dawn of times, there was Spacewalk. Uh, the first public commit of Spacewalk was in 28, uh, 2008. So it's quite old already. And this was only the first public commit. So I don't know when it started, but before that even. So we have code that is roughly 20 years ago. And Spacewalk was the upstream for Red Hat Satellite until 5, and the SUSE Manager until um, 3.2. And after. Um, Spacewalk has been dropped in May 2020, and Uyuni became the fork of Spacewalk and the new upstream forces manager. It brings quite a number of um, good things that are not in, that were not in Spacewalk, like SALT support, and uh, we have moved the UI from legacy JSP um, UI to React JS. Of course, it's not fully migrated yet. There is an ongoing process, but started. And we injected a lot of usability and scalability improvements. So here is approximately what an architecture of deployment looks like. And this one is a complex one. Um, you basically have two components, uh, two, two big pieces in, in Uni. You have the server. This is the, uh, the thing that has the intelligence. It has a database. It knows um, how to do things with, um, with your systems and so on. And it uses salt to do things. And you also have the proxy. The proxy 
is only delegating the API calls and sort calls to the server and caching the packages locally. You basically, uh, you, users that use proxy basically have them in remote locations for data centers or in retail environment where you have one proxy per store, for instance. And then you, can, you connect the systems to either the, uh, the proxy or the server. And you see that here I have one more level of server. Because the server can handle up to 10,000 systems, approximately. After that, well, you may run into scalability issues. To, to work around that, we have a hub architecture, so you can have multiple servers next to each other that are grouped together with a hub server. Um, I mentioned SALT. SALT has been introduced by uh, SUSE Manager and then UNI after, and it's fairly recent compared to the uh, spacewalk history. There is also what we call, in our jargon, the traditional stack. So the traditional stack is the old way that was used in Spacewalk to deploy the changes and talk to the systems. It was something based on a bunch of um, Python code um, running on the system and cron jobs and Jabber and OZ, just a real mess, I tell you. And this has been deprecated a while ago uh, by Uni and we already started removing it. So, in this chart showing up what components are on the server, I intentionally removed all these because they're out of scope for us. For containers, well, we'll not containerize them, they'll just go away. So we have a bunch of components here. The biggest one is Tomcat because it, it runs a web application, of, obviously. But uh, it communicates with many other things. The database, typically also the sort master because it has to call it to, to let it do the job. And it shares files with it. Um, Tomcat is also talking to Cobbler because um, Cobbler is used for pixie booting. Uh, we have a taskomatic, which is um, sort of a glorified cron thing that also talks to database and run things um, at regular schedules. And we also have Apache and WSGI scripts in the front of that. All this is kind of tightly coupled together, so it's not so easy to, to separate things. So what is the path we chose there? In the beginning, we were thinking about creating containers one after the other and, and, and go this way. But we went with another approach in the end. So we started with a giant, a gigantic image where um, we basically install Uni and run it as it is in a VM. Using it's the image using is using the um, base container image in it image, and it runs systemd. So then you run everything. You'll tell me it's not a big advantage there. The good thing is that it helps us deal with all the problems of putting the thing in the container, and then after we can deal with separating. So first we got that thing running on Padman. And um, well, that went pretty fast, pretty, pretty smoothly. We had to adjust the volumes that we need to mount because um, even us, we're not even totally sure what exact files are stored, where and what needs to be persisted all, in all times. We have a, a, a good overview, but as for being exactly sure we are not missing anything, that is another story. So adjusting volumes is, is needed. The setup, the setup scripts had to be fixed as well. Um, we'll see that in a, min in a minute. And then once that was in a reasonable state, we went, I, I went with K3S. Well, not only K3S, first RK2, 
So I ran, I ran the, uh, the, the same image on RK2, fixed a few things, implemented the Nginx ingress uh, rules, because Nginx documentation is way better than traffic. I already had issues last year when we containerized the uni proxy. I, I, I spent like three days, four, four days or something trying to understand traffic and this configuration and miserably failed. So I didn't want that to repeat that um, too early with the, uh, the server. So started with the RK2, went fine, was reasonably fast, and then tried with K K3S and traffic again because RK2 is still quite big. After this was working, then I wrote a ham chart, and then we're in the process of fixing the uh, automated tests. Because obviously, test suites um, have made a lot of assumptions over the time and that are not working for containers. Once we have all these in a reasonable, a reasonable enough state that we, can, we know it is usable, we'll release it for a uni. So you could use it either with Padman or with um, Kubernetes. And, and we'll go improving the thing over the time. But first, getting one single image that works, that works and then um, adjust later. And we also are working on some tools that I'll talk about later. Kubernetes, there are quite a few differences with what, how it happens in Podman. Because basically for Podman, you can think about it just like a VM running into a container. Just basically it. With Kubernetes, I disabled um, SSL, in, SSL certificate generation inside the container. Because in Kubernetes, you have super, super cool ways to generate your own certificates. You're using Cert Manager. It's totally automated. You can use that with Let's Encrypt, for instance. It generates the certificate, renews them, and, and so on. So that it is no, no operation thing. And it just works here. So certificates are generated outside of the container, which was not the case before. So setup script had to be adapted with that. And SSL is terminated, terminated at the ingress level, which means that it doesn't go inside the container. It, you have no SSL inside the container at all. And that was expected by some of the code. The, for instance, the, SSL, the redirection to the SSL version of a page was done at the Tomcat level. Woo! So now it's done by the ingress. Of course, Kubernetes needs to have ingress routes, which you don't have in anywhere else. And the thing that w has caused me quite a lot of trouble, and I'm pretty sure it's not fixed everywhere yet, is that Kubernetes doesn't let you change the host name of the container. It uses the pod name as the host name. Could be okay-ish if you had control on the pod name. But as soon as you start using deployments, the pod name has some random part in it. And you cannot rely on that at all. So I had to fix the setup scripts as well to get rid of all these um, code, assuming that the host name was the thing that we had to use for the FQDN had to, to add some more configuration bits for, for that. It's OK. I think postfix is not configured yet, for instance. And in Kubernetes, we uh, use init containers to populate the volumes that we attach with what is already in the Im image. Because you have some RPM folders, structures, and whatever that you need to copy over the, in the volume when they're empty. Podman does it automatically, from what I recall, but not Kubernetes. So how would it work for migrating from an existing VM or bare metal server to a Kubernetes one? Um, 
we have been working, we have proof of concepts and still, it's still work in progress with one Kubernetes job that runs with the same container image, the same volumes, and we uh, are mounting in uh, the SSH agent socket. I wrote here the SSH keys, but I don't think it's needed anymore. Just with the SSH agent, it's enough. You SSH add the key on, on, on the host and, and you have it in the, um, in the container. And then all you ha we have to do is run our sync. Um, and once you, you have it all done, you, rest you, start the, you start the new container, obviously, in the regular way, and point the DNS to the new machine, and that should be, should be working. I mentioned tools a little earlier because containers is something cool. Kubernetes is cool as well, but it sometimes scares people because of complexity and how will I manage that thing and how do I get into my container to run some commands, for instance. So these tools are here to, to make that a little easier. And for now, we have two tools just in the same scheme that what is in, in Kubernetes world. The Uni ADM one is to help set up the, um, the server to migrate, update, and things like that. And the Uni CTL is for day-to-day for -day tasks. For now, we only have subcommands to exec in, in the container or to copy files to and from the containers. But we'll surely add more depending on what thing we find would be useful there. But we're really at the beginning of that thing. And, and this is also why feedback would be also really cool. So what benefits can we expect here? Operating system independence. That is the first and obvious one for now. Uni runs only on leap 15.4. We are in the process of getting it running on 15.5, but it's just a, an effort we need to, go, to do every time. And there is one guy in the community who is uh, getting it to run on CentOS 8. And this is a tremendous effort that he's doing. With this, it's easy to run it on any distro. It will just be the, um, the leap image um, as a base, but no one will real, uh, realize that. And it also, also makes dependencies management easier. For instance, here we discovered we needed Saxon 10 or, or more, and it's not shipped in, in leap. Aha, how, how are we doing this? And with this, we could just get uh, the package um, ourselves, install it in our container, and not rely on it to be in, in Leap. It's just, um, just easier. Resilience. And this is one of the um, most common asked things. Um, this is something that will work, will work. I have not tested that yet, but I suppose it worse if we tweak enough the thing. So for now, the Helm chart creates deployment with one replica. We cannot have more because there are components that cannot work if you have two of them. Like you, if you have two Tomcat servers here um, talking to the same database, the code is not meant for that. Uh, to, to increase the number of replicas, we will have to go with some refactorings, of course. But just with one replica would be already good if you have a multi-node cluster and shared storage across all the nodes so that if a node crashes, Kubernetes would spawn the container on another node. So that's um, already good enough resilience. Scalability, and this is a big problem because it's not, it's not because we would ha have everything in containers that will get scalability for free. No. Um, one of the obvious example I can give you is Taskomatic here. Taskomatic runs a number of tasks, and one of them is a repo sync. To think that 
pulls all the RPMs from the online repos, caches, all, uh, caches them, extracts metadata, and stores that all into the database, and so on. This script can only be run once at the same time. We cannot have two. And even now, if you have reposing that runs and you want to get, uh, run reposing dash dash help, it shouts that you cannot run it twice <laughs> at the same time. So you see how broken that is. So without the refactoring, we can't scale that thing for sure. Even if you had multiple containers, it just wouldn't work. So scalability will be achieved at some point, but we need to carve out components first and refactor them just to make that possible. And carving out components, this is uh, what will come next. So getting it into one container that runs on Kubernetes is, is setting the foundation for that. And what we want to do is to, do, to, to go step by step. We have a huge application and we cannot just um, go randomly extract a component. So we will have to think about some criteria on how to select them. Um, I listed two here that are the most obvious. So first, the easiest ones like Apache or Postgres is rather easy because they're already containers, it's mostly configuration and volumes is rather, rather easy to do. And, and then need to think about, is it critical? Will it bring value if I add it into a separate container? Um, what, what will I gain by spending some effort refactoring that thing and extracting it to, to get that into a container? So this will, is what will help us figuring out what to extract first. The salt master, for instance, is a quite good candidate for one of the first ones, but still requires um, changes. So let's go for a little demo. And for a demo, I mean, it's, it's really short. Um, I meant to, oh, oh, that's right. Uh, where's my mouse? I didn't mirror the screen. So this is, uh, the machine on, on our uh, CI. I had to, so to stop our continuous integration to get a demo machine. Um, I had an issue this morning running system, uh, system D container on Kubernetes, on ARP, and uh, yes, um, funky things with SE Linux. <laughs> so this one is running, and not on ARP, but uh, on Leap, I think. Um, and you see that we have a number of systems. They have been bootstrapped, and um, we also have channels. So that thing, it, it really looks like the uh, regular thing. But the cool thing is here. Um, is that we have it running as a container. And, and you see the name with the funky part and at the end, random part? This is because it also is um, Cooper Kettle get deployment. This is a, a, deploy, a, a deployment with just one replica here. And, oh, maybe we can, we can go scary. Cooper Kettle get deployment. Minus O YAML O uni. Is it right? Because I'm typing without seeing what I'm typing. So this is the whole definition uh, of the deployment. And um, you see TLS keys here that are mounted from, from somewhere else. We have configuration that is stored in, in a config map somewhere. Uh, we have a lot of volumes, like about 20 or something. And uh, we have as much con con init containers as there are as volume, because we need to, com to fill them in if needed. Uh, what do we have, again, that is interesting here? 
Well, the big image, the big name image here is just the thing that runs the um, um, that runs the container. And um, for now, we have one systemd service that runs the setup the first time and disables it itself at the end. So there is a post run that dis that removes the service, but it's clearly not ideal. And this will be converted into a Kubernetes job. Maybe not this week, but soon, really soon. <laughs> um, yes, that's about it. And um, this one thing is running K3S and traffic. If someone wants to have some infos on how to set uh, traffic rules on non-TCP, non non-HTTP port um, routes, I can help. Um, but maybe it's not of interest for everyone. <laughs> um, there is only five minutes left. Um, do you have questions? Hi. Uh, you said it's uh, um, Linux uh, or can running on any Linux operating systems. But uh, what about the Raspberry Pi, for example? It's a different architecture and it's running Raspbian. Um, running on different architectures, I think it should be possible. But I have not tried it. <laughs> and yeah. In theory, that should be should be possible. Probably needs some tweaking still. Yeah, because I tried uh, Salt and it was not supported uh, the Raspberry devices. So mm. that's an interesting thing to look into. <laughs> <laughs> you would need an image that is not good for x 64 but for AI 64 mm? or whatever else architecture you want. So if you can build the whole I, I was looking for some solution two or three years ago, so maybe something changed. I don't know, but uh, I saw any operating system, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, any operating system, the uh, architecture still has an importance there. And uh, you see we are building our image here on, on OBS and um, here I just have x86-64 architecture, but we could add Arch64. Please and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> not, not that it will run out of the box without doing anything. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how do you uh, securely store the salt minion keys? Like, do you just mount them as a volume? The salt minion keys. Um, the salt minion keys are on the minion. And no, like the keys that you accept on the salt master. So, like, because when you like first time, like in SUSE Manager, you accept the. Yes, yeah, the yeah, yeah. Uh, I I will need to look into where the key ends up. <laughs> it probably is, there's there are all things in the database maybe, but I doubt the key is there, and I don't know out of top at the top of my head where salt is putting that thing. Okay, um, we are mounting a number of volumes. I would need to check if that one is mounted. <laughs> Another question? And if not, then, okay. It's just probably a more generic one uh, in terms of the project itself uh, moving to Kubernetes. Uh, can you speak closer? Yeah. Do you expect uh, some sort of improvements? Uh, uh, like, if you running this uh, Yumi in Kubernetes, do you expect the like the salt minions running on Kubernetes containers? What sort of applications it will manage in, at the end of the line? Because once you move to Kubernetes, you get in most of the configuration management stuff. 
built in and probably the clients will be also in Kubernetes after all. Well, just putting the server in containers has no impact on the minions. So you expect like it just will be a Kubernetes deployment with your yes. project? Yeah, yeah. That's all. No, no trouble. And we already have a uh, containerized proxy. And it has no impact. It's just about the processes that run to, to do the work. But w whether salt runs in a container and the salt minion runs in a container or not, we don't care. Cool. Thank you. So thank you all. If you have more questions after, um, you'll find me around and we can ask um, there. Thank you, guys.